From the Lucha Podcast Network, this is the Mass Startup Podcast. The Mass Startup Podcast profiles the most talented creators, impactful entrepreneurs, and high performing professionals with the purpose to drive insights, learnings, and tactics to help you build the things that you believe in. My name is Noa Visa. I'm the Strategic Partnerships Director at the Branson Center. I so happen to be based in Cape Town in South Africa. And that's who I am today. What is the Branson Center of Entrepreneurship? That is a very good question because I think it goes back to the idea of what is, does it mean to be an entrepreneur. And so I'm a podcaster as well. So you'll find that sometimes I try to deflect the questions. But <laughs> <laughs> So, but I'm going back to the idea of before I even define what the Branson Center is, it's this ethos of this idea of we believe that entrepreneurs are these entities that can go on to change business for good. And so mm. the Branson Center is probably the opposite of what you think it is when you hear the name. And so we are a venture studio that enables purpose led, entrepreneur led innovation to change business for good mm. in a way that solves for global challenges. Yeah. And so, effectively, whilst the obvious understanding is that we service entrepreneurs, but we actually service business, meaning that if you can enable big business to understand its purpose and to understand how it plays a role in changing business for good, the decisions that are made at big business level mm. are the very decisions that will then enable entrepreneurs. Mm. And if entrepreneurs are then enabled to be able to bring innovation into big business, it means together we're all changing business for good. Mm. So effectively, the Branson Center exists to join the suits to the sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great way of putting it. Do you think the suits and corporates really understand their responsibility in being able to change business for good and start to drive meaningful impact in society from, you know, just being capitalistic endeavors to going, hey, you know what, actually, how do we then, you know, plow back in some way? Mm. Some suits, and so for us, suits is encompasses both big business and also the investors. Mm. And so some suits will have a notional understanding of their responsibility, but also the opportunity they can play, they can find in changing business for good. But there's something that disconnects the moment then they start thinking about the bottom line. And what we're here to say is that there doesn't need to be a disconnect between building and growing an inclusive economy mm. that enables healthy people and sustains a planet that is thriving. Mm. And so people are starting to understand that because some of these things are starting to become urgent and actually a crisis. So on one hand, you can talk about the climate crisis, but actually you can also talk the, about the crisis around the fight for relevance. Mm. And so if your business, big business, or even you as an investment house, if you are no longer relevant, you can't can continue doing what you do, which is to try and make money, to try and optimize shareholder value, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And so we are here to talk about, when we're talking about changing business for good, it's not a feel good. It's not something that has to then sit on the shoulders of impact-driven, purpose-led entrepreneurs. It is absolutely critical to your survival. It is absolutely critical to you possibly remaining relevant, even just for the next three years, because we're seeing what the rate of change is like. In fact, I would implore anyone listening to almost do a quick comparative of what were the companies that were sitting on the Fortune 500 list 500, 50 years ago, and look at what's sitting on the Fortune 500 list today, mm. and then also see how quickly companies are slipping off the Fortune 500 list. Before, a company could sit on the Fortune 500 list maybe for up to 75 years. These days, it's about 15 years and declining. So nobody gets to be top dog for a very long time. And so if you want to at least be relevant, mm. you need to start thinking about these issues around changing business for good, which means you're having a positive impact on definitely the economy, definitely on people, definitely on the planet. Yeah. When you look at the entrepreneurs that are accessing the programs that you have and you know are a part of the, the ecosystem that you guys are building, what are you guys looking for typically? So interestingly enough, going back to even how we were founded and what we stand for. So, of course, founded on the back of the name of our namesake, Sir Richard Branson, mm. who really understands in terms of how he's built businesses. It's all about, screw it, let's do it. And so, you know, when I'm proud to be part of the Virgin family, 
where we can look back and say, you know, being part of the Branson Centre, being part of the Virgin family means you're part of a, a, an organisation, a family that's got 53 years of experience of smart disruption in over 50 industries, some spectacular wins, some formidable brands that have come through, mm. and then some interesting maybe failures or losses or oopsies. That's okay. That's all part of the thing. Mm. So it means that when we're coming into the ecosystem, we're not here to train any entrepreneurs. We're not here to teach any entrepreneurs. We're here to enable entrepreneurs. And so we're always asking ourselves the question is, which is the best way in which we can enable a founder to go on to change business for good themselves? So one of the things that we always talk about is how can we unlock purpose in an entrepreneur? They really have it, but perhaps how can they articulate it, Mm -hmm. how can they embed it in their businesses and how can they measure the success of their business against their purpose. That's one thing. In terms of practically what can we do that really is enabling as opposed to training or teaching, it is how can we enable an entrepreneur to access network, how can we enable an entrepreneur to access finance and how can we enable an entrepreneur entrepreneur to access customers. Mm -hmm. And so what are we looking for in terms of, wow, that's a good bet. We're looking for a business that already has impact by design embedded in what's going on. And so for us, we like to focus on things like what we call the earth shots. So businesses that have a very clear, positive impact on things that have got to do with climate, with waste, with the ocean, with air quality, that that sort of thing, because there are massive opportunities, some of them right now, but also on the horizon Mm. in terms of entrepreneurial innovation and how that can solve for some of the biggest problems in terms of the planetary health. There is massive amounts of money to be made in the spec sector. There is also incredible reform happening from a policy perspective, locally, Mm. internationally. And so competitive advantage for founders will actually be embedded in this idea of can you show that your business is already talking about impact on planet and ready to make money in this space. Mm. So we're looking for that. We're looking for founders who have businesses that can scale both in South Africa but actually be fit to scale globally because we're talking about solving global challenges. And we're looking for businesses that also have the ability to work with other businesses. Mm. So effectively, we're not looking for unicorns because are they even real? But what we are are looking for are these zebras. Mm. So businesses that have the ability to work in a herd and then leave the environment a little bit better off than before. You didn't use the term, which is often sort of associated with entrepreneurs that are, you know, focused on people, planet, and impact specifically, mm. which is social entrepreneur. How is that? This is a personal philosophy, mm. which is every time you add an adjective in front of the word entrepreneur, you immediately take that entrepreneur out of the room and mm. you add them and you put them in another box. And so whether we're talking about social entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs, creative township entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs creative entrepreneurs, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And then you've, you've already boxed them out of the room. For me, it's about an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. And then it's on us as the enablers of the entrepreneurs to understand sector, what success looks like for that entrepreneur, and then get them wrapped up with the right you know, resources that they need to then achieve what success looks like. But I'm not going to define you as you walk into the room, mm. which means I take you out the room immediately. I don't want to call them social entrepreneurs mm. then, right? So these entrepreneurs who have this focus on impact, mm. on people, on planet, it's a very different frame of thinking or approach to try and build a business around this, right? And the way you build this business, the intention that you do it needs to be very different. Have you seen you know, characteristics or formulas for how they're building that is so different from what was traditionally seen as the right way to build things? Mm. I think it starts, takes us back to that word formula. Mm. There is no formula. And so the way to enable an entrepreneur to really get to where they need to be is to first understand them understand why they do what they do, which is purpose, Mm. understand what keeps them up at night, what gets them out of bed, and then sit with the entrepreneur and understand what does success look like for them. Because it's very easy for us to come in and say, for us, we think this business will then be seen as successful when it has X 
in terms of revenue, when it's got Y in terms of jobs created mm -hmm. and is perhaps operating in these territories. That's my dream for that business, which means that that's my version of success. Mm -hmm. Is that entrepreneur really going to then be attached to the plans that you put in place together to get them to success when you've articulated success for them? And so once you've got to a place where you're okay with an entrepreneur articulating what success looks like for them, you then start putting into place the things that will enable them. And mm -hmm. so perhaps the characteristic there is rather, is this an individual who is open to sharing? Is it an, is it an individual who is open to articulating even the things that frighten them? Is this an individual who's also able to communicate when things aren't fitting? You know, they're not looking at this as a top-down relationship and so it's a partnership. And so perhaps maybe this is part of also how we do our work as the Branson Centre. We, we don't have a big call for applications and run cohorts. We rather create conversations and create communities around specific themes. Mm -hmm. And then based on what we understand is happening in that specific sector, we invite certain entrepreneurs to work with us and we then need to demonstrate value to them mm -hmm. as opposed to them demonstrating value to us because they've got in place everything they need to, to run that business. They just need to be enabled and they need a partner for a thousand days, maybe even longer. And so I don't know what the characteristics are and I don't want to know what the characteristics are because there is no formula, mm -hmm. but it rather depends on what is the need? Can we truly say we can work together? And are you willing to work with us? And mm -hmm. let's then define success based on what you want. When you look at entrepreneur enablement in South Africa and like what is, you know, definitely might be missing or a gap that you guys are trying to fill, what would that be? It is the gap between a very strong programmatic focus, lots of programs out there, and there's a gap between what happens when those programs end and then what we want to see. Mm -hmm. And so people are coming into a lot of programs, they're receiving a lot of training, a lot of mentorship, and then at the end of a time period, we graduate them, we wish them well, and then we wonder why we're not seeing success. So I think the idea and the gap that we're specifically trying to fill is this idea of what does it look like when entrepreneurs, four entrepreneurs, are in the game as opposed to program managers, people who are coaches, working with entrepreneurs? You described the Branson Center as a venture studio. studio. What does that mean? So, now I'm very good at remembering book titles, but then never remember the author, so forgive me. But there is a book that we all ended up reading and circulating amongst ourselves called The Unicorn Within. And it talks about how there is a place for ventures and venture building that will actually drive innovation within large businesses and corporations. And so what it says or what it informs us at the Branson Centre is that if you sit and every day you are banging on, on just training, teaching, enabling entrepreneurs, but you're not looking at the greater ecosystem, which is then big market opportunities. Mm. So big business needs to be in this game as well. Big business is not set up to be entrepreneurial either. Mm. So actually what you're trying to do is enable entrepreneurship in both parts of this equation, which is the entrepreneur who's growing a business and big, big business that's probably hungry and desperate for entrepreneurial this entrepreneurialism, mm. but also perhaps entrepreneurial innovation. So that's kind of context. But for us, a venture studio then is about building ventures and investing in ventures within the same sort of house, mm. as opposed to we train, 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 and then we hope you'll get investment. And the other bit that we ha we don't say out loud is also making sure that these ventures have access then to market opportunities, and it's all happening within the same shop. And that's why we look at ourselves as a venture studio. The second bit around venture studio for me, as a word nerd, is the idea of studio already tells you that we're doing. 
Mm. We're creating, we're building, we're breaking, we're trying. We might even be burning our fingers a little bit. Um, we're, we're playing. And so that, that is also important even for ourselves as a team to understand that we're here to be in a studio and to just try things out and be quite messy as well. So that's also just the ethos around it. Yeah, I mean, traditionally there's a lot of, you know, in the ecosystem and whether that's the past or, you know, where we are now, a very traditional sort of incubator, accelerator. How do you think of those models and how they've sort of been able to drive impact in the ecosystem versus, you know, this new thinking of a venture studio? So I think the the place for incubators and, and accelerators, of course, is about incubation. So it really is how do we take an idea and try and grow it and nurture it. I think in certain respects that is incredibly necessary because the reality is, for example, as a black woman, I don't come from a family that's made up of entrepreneurs. I don't come from Mm -hmm. a family that's got money or even sort of those social safety nets. And so perhaps when I'm at the early stages of my business, I do need to be in an environment that's highly structured, really given, that gives me a roadmap in terms of where I'm going. Mm. And maybe I need to see many other people who look like me in the room at the same time. So I think that's been the the really, really incredible role of incubators and accelerators in sort of the traditional form because of that community aspect, the sense of safety and security that comes through. Where the venture studio then breaks away a little bit from that is that you're then bringing in effectively the virgin way, Mm. which is you've got to every now and again be able to just reach a little bit further out onto the edge of the cliff and be okay to jump off the cliff. The venture studio will be there to catch you and hopefully let you fly. Mm. And so we talk about flight plans and flight paths. Um, You know, we so happen to have also a space company. (laughs) (laughs) So I think Venture Studio just brings in a little bit more of a robustness to it. It's not for everyone, and I'm not here to evangelize for everyone to be mm. a part of this. And you shouldn't be. That's okay. And the same way that not everyone is meant to be an entrepreneur, by the way. But I think Venture Studio just brings in the next step that is even riskier, even scarier. Mm. But my goodness, I think the rewards are really, they're there. When you sort of speak to entrepreneurs and you showing them this new way of building things and when they've sort of built something that can sort of work in the structures that you guys have built what are you saying to them will happen with that journey what is the impact that you hope to have on them and also have you seen that impact in entrepreneurs that came into that ecosystem and came out the other side you could you could see that okay wait this is what really happened oh. to them and this is how their businesses have been you know, changed by it as well. Mm. Let's talk about COVID. <laughs> so pandemic starts 2020, everybody's lives change. Mm. And the big panic at that point was every venture that's within the Branson Center's sort of ecosystem, how do we make sure that we can save jobs? Or in fact... Our biggest fear is that everybody's going to close and possibly lose jobs. Mm. And so the the real focus and the arrowhead for our focus was how do we just maintain and save jobs. Up until now, our, one of our key performance indicators has been around the job creation aspect of the businesses that we work with. So our indicator of success with any venture that works with the Branson Center is this idea of does it have the ability to scale and create 100 full-time equivalent jobs in South Africa over a thousand days. Mm -hmm. So there was always this idea of job creation through the businesses. Suddenly the pandemic hits and it's about just save jobs. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to report that through the the, the hardest parts of lockdowns, the pandemic, not one of the businesses that was within our ecosystem and still is lost a job. Mm -hmm. That's insane when you think about how shut down the economy was and so how did these businesses get to save their jobs? Well, it goes back to this idea of our impact on a business is to enable purpose. Mm. When a founder understands their purpose, suddenly you'll find that they're not that attached to the how. Mm. They know what they need to do to keep on impacting and enabling their purpose and seeing it being enacted. And so you find a business that perhaps was selling product, 
suddenly going into a business that goes, well, when we were selling product, we were a B2C business. During this moment, we can still pivot our model and become a B2B business and still have our purpose being enabled, for example. Mm. So our impact in any, any business that we work with is can you articulate your purpose, can you embed it, and when the times are tricky, can you go back to your purpose to help you make the next decision that is right for your business? I think what has been very exciting is watching one of the founders we worked with in the early days who's gone on to really grow the business. It's, it's a pretty recognizable name and brand on the high streets of South Africa. Mm. And seeing that entrepreneur, as they've reached a new level of their business, them ringing the Branson Center up, well, proverbially, but <laughs> making contact with us and saying, I want to have another conversation with you about purpose because... I'm now elevating the business into this realm. I'm now creating X number of jobs. This is mm. what I'm, my expansion plans look like. I just want to make sure that I'm still true to my purpose. That for me is actually a very, very sort of understated indi indicator of success where this business is successful. In fact, this founder has gone on to actually become an investor as well in terms mm. of other businesses. And yet they still remember that if I'm going to be making a specific decision that is so big, I need to have a conversation about purpose. Mm. And perhaps I need to go back to the Branson Center. What does purpose mean in the context of entrepreneurship? Wow, no, that's a big question. Purpose, funny enough, is probably starting to become one of those junk words. Mm. You know, like innovation. Disruption. Disruption. <laughs> pivot. <you> know, pivot. <laughs> even sustainability. So that's a good question. And I say this as somebody who speaks the language of purpose, and so I can acknowledge that it's a junk word. Mm. But for us, what we mean by purpose is, what is your North Star? What is that thing that you rely on to guide you in all that you do? Why do you get out of bed and why do you do what you do? And is this thing, when defined, when you can articulate it, is it something that ignites something in you and in those around you. Therefore, it's something that's inspiring. And so in the context of entrepreneurship, is this the thing that when you articulate it will attract talent into your business mm -hmm. and the right talent? Is this the thing that will inspire your customers to not only keep buying from you, but perhaps to even advocate for your business and your brand? Is this the thing that will inform your suppliers about who you are and therefore how you engage with each other? So, I mean, those are sort of three examples around how purpose, when it's clearly articulated and embedded in a business, starts helping you make decisions, but also enables a community of support around your business because that purpose is clear. And, you know, obviously you guys have a lot of, whether it's, it's models or programs, to really help entrepreneurs navigate purpose in that way how do you go about forming it but more than that like you were mentioning about this entrepreneur who's doing really great things going hey you know i've reached a new level mm. my purpose is evolving mm. i now need to try and find a way to help it move with what we're trying to do so how do i find that purpose in my sort of journey and it, it, it does sort of feel like purpose and vision in this place are just like dancing between each other totally so how do I form it? And then more than that, how do I, you know, chart the course for evolving it as I grow and go through my journey? Mm. So interestingly enough, my opinion, and I know it's, it's debatable, is that purpose doesn't necessarily change. It's if it, Once you have had the amazing moment of being able to articulate your purpose, very rare that it will change. So my purpose is to connect people to each other and to opportunities. If you know me from, you know, previous lives or even right now, mm -hmm. that's 100% who I am. And even the work of getting to articulate my purpose is a, a piece of work that came from different angles, right? So there's a professional angle, there's a personal angle, there's mm -hmm. lived experience. There's also hopes of and ambitions of who I am. So it's who I am. And, and, and it's right now, today, I cannot imagine that my expression of my purpose will change in terms of it's to connect. Mm. I even have a tattoo that says connect on my arm. Mm. <laughs> so that's purpose there. 
vision, I think, is the thing that then starts evolving based on time and circumstance. And so where purpose is helpful is that it always remains, it's almost like when you think about the old Mercedes Benz where the star sat on the bonnet of the car. Mm. You always were looking at this thing driving. You never got it. You'll never reach it. But it will always be there in front of you. and It will always take you where you need to go, right? Mm. Um, and so where purpose is then helpful in terms of navigating different situations based on time and circumstance is that when purpose is truly embedded in the different parts of your business, finance, brand, your people strategy, when you're navigating tricky waters, but also when you're navigating moments of opportunity, each part of your business, led by different teams with different people, will be able to answer what is specific to its function mm. relative to the purpose of the business. Yeah. yeah. When you think about personal development and how you know, that has become way more of a factor in the development of entrepreneurs where it was, you know, previously maybe it was just like, okay, what are your numbers? What is the mm. opportunity here? Now it's like, okay, but who are you and why are you uniquely positioned to be able to solve this really important problem? And who will you be when things get real? Mm. How do you guys think about that personal development piece, but your just your personal opinion around you know, personal development and how important that is mm. to being an entrepreneur and, and trying to bring these, whether it's a purpose or your vision to life? A couple of thoughts, many thoughts. Um, <laughs> so if, let me first almost be a ventri ventriloquist. Oh, I did pick the hardest word there in my brain. <laughs> let me be a ventriloquist for Sir Richard Branson. Richard, whenever he is talking to a group within the Virgin business, mm. he, will, he, he will inspire and ask people to do one thing, which is draw a circle around yourself, put yourself in the center of that circle, and understand that your job every single day is to protect and look after the person in the middle of that circle. Mm. So looking after yourself and understanding how and what you need to look after yourself is very important. Two, from a personal perspective, when I think about personal development, it goes back to what kind of human are you? I'm a seeker of fun, a seeker of joy, a connector, which means that for me, wellness comes back to how much fun am I having, how much joy am I bringing into the world, and how connected do I feel to other people. And so it's important that you start to know yourself and you start being able to articulate that to other people so that other people know how to look after you and or know when things aren't going so well for you. Mm. So at the Branson Center, we talk a lot about being fit for purpose as well, which is this idea of where are you in terms of your physical health, your mental health and your emotional health. Those things do contribute to how entrepreneurs build things, right? Totally. Because like you are consistently within your body and you need to be able to use your body, your mind, your spirit, whatever it is, to you know building this thing of yours. Um, you spoke about just how you guys are also forming conversations and building communities mm. around specific topics. Mm. Have you, can you speak more to the work you guys are doing from that perspective? Absolutely. So, you know... We are very proud about the idea that we are positioning ourselves as the enabler of business, big and small, in very much sectors that are for the planet. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we are here to start conversations around what is sustainability? How is it misunderstood? How is it sometimes just green washed, blue washed, white washed for different reasons and more importantly what is the role that entrepreneurial -led innovation can play in unlocking matters of sustainability mm. so it's having that conversation because I think something like it's sustainability sits in the traditional space that maybe CSI sits mm. you know public relations and that kind of thing and yet it's such an important driver. We have conversations around what we call the earth shots. And so asking ourselves questions like, wouldn't it be cool if we could fix our climate? Wouldn't it be cool if we could revive our oceans? Wouldn't it be cool if we lived in a waste-free world? And suddenly that starts off as a question and then you start unpacking like, what are the opportunities when you start talking about a waste-free world? What are those opportunities in terms of entrepreneurial-led innovation that will probably drive big changes in industries and in big business. 
That, those are the conversations that we're having. I'm not here to have a conversation about recycling, mm. but I'm here to have a conversation about smart packaging, for example. As an opportunity. As an opportunity, as being, yeah. yes. And I'm not here to be punitive about it either. So I'm not here, go, I'm not going to show you photographs of dead penguins on an ocean, but wouldn't it be cool if we then had a conversation about reviving our oceans on an island where we got inspired and, you know, we started dreaming out loud and then we started finding where the opportunities lie for reviving the ocean, mm. for growth in a business and for entrepreneurial innovation. How important is community for entrepreneurs in the ones that you're building, but also in the greater ecosystem? Community is important, I mean, just for humans, right? And mm. so I think every now and again, we, we kind of other entrepreneurs and we make them these other beings. No human can exist with our community. Just start there. Mm. But in the context of somebody who's trying to build a business, community is important in the sense that you need other people who are going through the same journey that you are going. You need people who've gone before you. You need people who are a little bit just behind you as well, if you think a bit f about it from a linear point of view, because that way we're all just feeding each other and we're hopefully all supporting each other, inspiring each other, giving cautionary tales to each other. Mm. We also need, for me, community also think, talks about your champions, your advocates. Who are the people who make you look good when you're not in the room? For me, that's also a part of community because... You can't be everywhere all the time, and you don't need to be. Your community will do the work for you. So your responsibility as being part of a community is to nourish the community by being selfless. I always say don't be a dick. So <laughs> really share, mm. be generous, mean what you say and say what you mean, and the community will then look after you because you're nourishing the community with your contribution and you're being responsible with your community and, and to this, your community. And this speaks to the values of a person and mm -hmm. how important that can be to contributing not only to a community but also to their purpose as well. Absolutely. Do you guys look at the values of entrepreneurs in how they're building their businesses? So I think this is what's fun about purpose is it takes us away from, you know, I remember writing my first business plan many years ago mm. and you know you always had your page which was your logo and then you had your little spider diagram which was my values or the business's values mm. and you had integrity authenticity you know reliability. you just named the, exactly the ones that I, <laughs> everyone knows this list <laughs> we know this list and we put it out there we'd be like and these are our values mm. how many people are really like understanding what that means and how does that really apply to who you are the nice thing about purpose is that it becomes so deeply embedded in terms of who you are and why you do what you do that you no longer need to sit and really articulate and list values. Mm. You articulate your purpose and because, as I said, it invokes something in you and in others, people get it. I don't think when I say my purpose is to connect people to each other and to opportunities, I don't think there's much definition that's needed there in terms of what my values are because immediately I I hope you understand that I'm somebody who's collaborative, who's gener generous, hopefully somebody who listens but also speaks, mm -hmm. you know, because that's what connecting looks like and feels like, you know. So that's where I'm at. So values aren't something that we're going to sit and try and have a formula and say, well, if this entrepreneur has four of these five values, they sit on here on the leaderboard. It's going, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The values will come through once this entrepreneur has been able to articulate their purpose. You guys also, you know, delve very deeply into the, you know, meaningful subject matters on your podcast as well. Can you speak more about the podcast itself, mm -hmm. but the, the, the intention behind it and the conversations that you're having there? So we have a podcast called In Conversation with the Branson Center. I drew the short straw and became the host <laughs> of the podcast and I enjoy it immensely. So far, we've put out about three content series specific to this podcast. Mm. The first one, the intention there was a little bit of something that was my own cheekiness. I insisted on having a podcast series that each guest was, every guest was a woman. Mm. I needed to see, I needed South African entrepreneurs, but also the ecosystem to understand that women, and particularly women of color, 
can hold the space and can hold conversations around very specific subjects. In fact, these are the subject matter experts. Mm. I needed the ecosystem to understand this because I think there's, there are a lot of moments where you walk into rooms and people who look like me aren't in front of that room. We're the recipients of certain things. And so that tells a certain story and that instills something that's not helpful into the ecosystem. So that was a very specific choice. That season one of the podcast, we very much focused on what we call the areas of impact in terms of every business can impact different areas within itself, but also in the economic environment. Mm. In order for those areas of impact to have positive change or positive effect, purpose needs to be woven through into each of those areas of impact. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at subjects such as brand and how do you actually, what are the principles of building a great brand and how do you infuse purpose into that and what are sort of the hacks to get purpose showing up in brand. So that mm -hmm. was, for example, season one. Season two of the podcast, we started going into then some of the deeper subjects within those areas of impact. So now you're not just talking about, you know, brand, but you're actually talking about customer segmentation that is required in order for you to build a brand. Mm. And there the focus was on how do you find subject matter experts who are practitioners? And so how do you get, you know, the chief marketing officer of a fintech, you know, a, a, a multinational fintech to come and have a conversation about data-driven customer segmentation, for example, no one is here as a teacher. They're here as a practitioner. Mm. Our third series, which was fascinating for me because it's not my space, but I learned so much around it, was around ocean innovation. How can something like the ocean economy be a driver of economic growth, but at the same time, how can economic activities be used to revive the ocean, for example? Mm. So... It's different subject matter, but I think for me it's interesting. It's a little bit different. We also had the very good fortune of being able to catch Richard when he was here in Cape Town, so I also got to be able to interview That's him. That's amazing. And he's, he's, he's fun to talk to. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, it, it was important for us to create content that inspires, that is also available and accessible to anyone, whether you are thinking about a business, running a business, or growing a business and being able to leverage like the 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 insights from people that mm. you might not have access to, right? Mm. That's super important mm. from a mentorship perspective. How do you guys think about mentorship for entrepreneurs? Oh, mentor mentorship is such an odd word for us. So we don't actually talk about mentorship. We talk about how do we enable the person with a series of individuals who are relevant to where that individual is as a person, mm. where they are in relation to what they're building. And then, of course, knowing that what they're doing is also specific to an industry, to a sector, and also what success looks like. So rather than giving you one person who you have coffee with every two weeks, we give you a relationship manager who walks the journey with you for as long as you're with the Branson Center. That relationship manager then brings in the right types of experts as and when you need them in your business. Some of them will come in and be technical and just dive into your business and sort something out with you that is very practical and technical. Somebody else might be coming in because maybe you need some coaching or you mm. need a conversation, et cetera, et cetera. So mentoring for us is not as it's seen traditionally. I don't think that surprises you, but it's more around how do you enable, again, the entrepreneur based on what they need and based on what they want. Yeah. And this is where, like, the, the, the traditional versus, I can't say social entrepreneur, <laughs> entrepreneurs <laughs> who focus on impact mm -hmm. really changes mm -hmm. things in the approaches of how to find the right opportunity. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the process of trying to find opportunities from that perspective versus a traditional way you're going, okay, how much money can I make here? Mm -hmm. Let me just find something that will be able to help me, you know, and I'm charging a markup on this, you know, small pro product, whatever it is. And I'm just trying to make sure that you know, I'm, I'm growing in some way. Mm. Whereas this is about, you know, I'm going to find a really meaningful problem that I want to solve 
and I'm going to build a solution that no one else has really, you know, been able to deliver efficiently. Yeah. Can I maybe make an example? Absolutely. So, very boring, mundane problem, which is how do we divert organic waste from landfill? Mm. I mean, that no one's excited when they when I say that, right? But it's a real problem. What does it look like when you create a curbside recycling collection business that is so well branded and has everything that you need to for you to separate your recycling and your organic material? Your recycling gets picked up once a week from your curbside and then that business is creating a large number of jobs but then is able to divert organic waste from landfill but what it's actually doing is that it then becomes a business that's a platform that allows for you to actually live in a house where you you're package free so effectively this business then is also the business that's able to come and refill your liquid soap dispensers mm. it's a business that can perhaps even bring in you know your dry goods and refill them in your house and so effectively you now a house that sits with you know sustainable packaging solutions in your home started off as the problem was diverting organic waste from landfill what you're seeing is recycling being collected from your house but effectively what's happening is that this business is starting to change your decisions in your home that now you're sitting with large containers for example and you're getting them refilled mm. and you see how then so that change unlocks spending opportunities for then your customer because they want more and more and more from you and so it means that the entrepreneur is still embedded on solving for that problem in terms of that's the impact mm. the money follows so it is a mindset where it's very easy to slip into a, a misconception that if you are a business that has impact by, by design embedded in it you cannot aim for large revenue you cannot be ambitious about your profit margins you cannot be ambitious about keeping costs low all the things that are necessary to keep a business financially sustainable mm. you can but that's not the thing that's almost just the scorecard the thing that you're really if you're driven by the impact all those things will start working their, their way around you because even your customer who you maybe would have thought at this point is price sensitive so the kind of customer I'm talking about for this business is not a price sensitive customer necessarily and so they'll back you with everything that they you're doing because they've clearly understood your purpose and why you do what you do mm. and so they'll they'll walk the journey with you because you are also fulfilling what they want to see in the world. Yeah. Do you hope a lot more entrepreneurs start to take on this new kind of way of building things? And what does it look like when, you know, the entire continent is full of entrepreneurs that think in this way, where they say, you know, the impact matters just as much as the numbers and the profit? Mm. I don't even hope. I'm I'm weeping. I really want everyone to think in this way not that i want everyone to think the same but you know it, it it's it's also such a refreshing way of building business mm. it is you know behind all of this you're also talking about people centered business building people centered design is just so exciting and so by the time you start thinking about what this looks like for the continent i think first of all let's not underestimate the african continent's ability to leapfrog different processes mm. you know we saw it very quickly with the mobile phone with you know the advent of mobile phones so we have the ability to leapfrog existing ways of doing things when it comes to building businesses we don't need to pay school fees in the same way that you know certain economies have already done mm. so actually this is possible and then you start dreaming and you start thinking that maybe you're living in a utopia but this is when we're starting to think about unleashing creativity and so we start elevating and adding value to what we're doing so when when we talk about the circular economy for example very quickly people think that you're trying to take old tires and make you know sandals out of them well what does it look like when some of these objects start becoming objects of high design and desirability with the same price tag that you would expect from something off Fifth Avenue, for example. Mm. But actually, it speaks to the circular economy. What does it look like when you unleash 
people who enjoy their jobs and people who are excited about going to work, which means that they are more willing to build thriving companies because they're happy. <laughs> mm. And so it goes. What does it look like when we're not so stressed about the climate crisis anymore because we are really, you know, thick in the, in the renew- renewable energy game? And that changes certain conversations around where people work, how people work, what they do with themselves. So the opportunities are, are big when you start thinking about entrepreneurial innovation driven by businesses that have impact by design is the key to unlocking the Africa we wish to see. We know that things aren't working if we mm-hmm. just keep doing the same thing as it's been happening. What we're doing is every now and again we see some green shoots, but everybody goes back to doing what they've been doing, which means we're perpetuating the very things that did us harm 100 years ago. What does impact and success look like for the Branson Centre over the next year to five? Okay. Today we are in 2023. Mm. I never know what where we are. I mean, I think COVID just messed up yeah, our timelines. Yeah, we just don't know how to count. Like. <laughs> so I actually had to really find it. So we're in 2023, and so when I think about um, 2030, actually, what do we want to see as the Branson Centre? We want to be working with no less than 100 ventures mm. that have the ability to create 100 full-time equivalent jobs in South Africa, meaning that that's 10,000 jobs that are created in South Africa. We want to see these ventures, of course, be able to work anywhere in the world, but we, let's start here. We want to see that through these businesses and through enabling them, that these businesses have raised a billion rand. So we want to move a billion rand into the economy through these businesses. And we want to make sure that 100% of these businesses with whom we work are purpose-led in all that they do. And that's what success looks like. Thank you. My pleasure. access previous episodes of this podcast but also again access to other shows on our network please visit lucha.com